You know, when we moved from East Tennessee to Middle Tennessee, Candy and I realized why our community is called Music City, right? I mean, if you, how many country music fans in here? Okay, a few country music fans. Whether you like country music or not, you know it's infiltrated our community. So much so that we have become the bachelorette party capital city of the country. Did you know that? I mean, like we have more bachelorette parties here. And if you go downtown, like Candy and I went last night for dinner, at any given moment, you will see hundreds of aspiring cowgirls flying into our city who have never worn boots or hats before, roaming around or riding in the back of open pickup truck. But anyway, you realize it's everywhere, right? You can walk down by the Johnny Cash Museum or the Country Music Hall of Fame or even go by any of the honky-tonk bars on Broadway and you'll realize that we have allowed, sadly, country music to infiltrate our theology. I've learned early on, you can't let the big 98 teach you about God, right? Because we know there are no holes in the floor of heaven and the devil doesn't play a fiddle, right? So we know these things already. Uh, But one of the things I I wanna teach you today is that there was one man who got it right. The great theologian, country singer, Aaron Tippin, who said you gotta stand for something or you will fall for anything. You remember this? Anybody remember this song from the 90s, right? What we're gonna talk about today is how Daniel and his three friends understood that this is more than a country song. This is a mantra to live by. This is a conviction we all should have as believers of Jesus Christ. If you have a Bible, I hope you do. Turn with me to Daniel chapter two. Excuse me, Daniel chapter two. Let me give you the backstory of what's happening up to this point. Nebuchadnezzar, the uh, ruler of Babylon who ransacked Jerusalem and deported all the Jewish people to Babylon has a dream one night. He's woken up, uh, awoken in the middle of the night by this dream and he doesn't know what it means. And so he summons all the magicians and the sorcerers and the medians and the astrologers and none of them could, could interpret the dream. So he's basically gonna kill them all. And right before that, he hears that a Jewish boy that he took into his court by the name of Daniel actually has the gift of interpretation. So Daniel comes in, he says, hey, just for the record, I can't do this, but through God, I can. And so Daniel interprets the dream, Nebuchadnezzar is overjoyed, and this is what happens next. Daniel chapter two, verses 46 and following. If you're there, we like to say word at Long Hollow, so you can say word if you're there. The word of the Lord. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell face down and worshiped who? That's interesting, worships Daniel. And gave orders to present an offering and incense to him. The king said to Daniel, your God is indeed God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many generous gifts. He made him ruler over the province, the entire province of Babylon and chief governor over all the wise men of Babylon. Now, just kind of a sidebar. I wrote a half of a sermon this week about this phrase, the wise men, because it's fascinating about how I believe because Daniel interprets the dream, Babylon or King Nebuchadnezzar puts him over the wise men. And if you notice this same phrase, wise men, as we find this phrase in the New Testament, where? Do you remember? When the wise men come to Jesus' parents with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I built the case why I believe that these same wise men's grandchildren and great, 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 great grandchildren are actually the men who traveled to Bethlehem to give Jesus' parents money that they cashed in to make it two years in Egypt while Herod, while Herod was killing the children. But that's another sermon maybe for Christmas. Sorry. So we won't go there. What I wanna speak on today, which I think is a more applicable point, and that is I'm gonna teach you today about the power of biblical conviction and why we need it, and let's see what happens. So at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to manage the province. So Daniel said, hey, if I'm gonna be blessed, let me bring my my, my, uh, friends with me, uh, and we're gonna manage the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained at the king's court. Now here's the principle, one truth, two subpoints or two supporting points. I wanna teach you today, Long Hollow, that we need to live by a set of biblical convictions. 
And there's a difference between a conviction and a standard. A conviction is a set of beliefs that you fully live by, you're fully convinced about. It defines your life. It, it, it shapes how you think and how you act and how you speak and how you treat people. Now there's a difference between a conviction and a standard. A standard are things you learn or things you are knowledgeable about. A conviction is something you stake your life on. It's something that you live out. It's something that you must adopt that you're convinced about. And what we're gonna see today is that Daniel himself and his three friends live by conviction. I said this last week. You have to decide before you're having to decide in the moment how you're gonna live. That's a conviction. The way you develop a conviction is simply this. Daniel shows us a principle I want us to get, and that is this. Daniel knew going into Babylon that God owned everything and controlled everyone. And I want you to get this today. God controls everything and everyone. Do you believe that? This is yes? This is no, right? This is yeah, okay. See, here's what Daniel knew. Daniel knew that even though he was working in Babylon, he had been given an assignment by God to be there. And he knew who controlled the king. And I'll show it to you. You gotta understand, King Nebuchadnezzar, kind of the king leader of the world at that time, they were conquering all the nations. King Nebuchadnezzar comes into Jerusalem, he ransacks the community, he decimates the temple, he pillages through the, the, the belongings of the people. He uh, rapes some of the family members. He deports all of the people to Babylon and he's in control. It looks really bad, but I believe Daniel knows what his friend and contemporary Jeremiah the prophet says about Nebuchadnezzar. Because you gotta realize Daniel and Jeremiah are friends or definitely know about each other. And here's what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 27, six, watch this. Jeremiah says, so now I have placed, this is God talking, all of the lands under the authority of my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. That's fascinating. What does God call Nebuchadnezzar? My servant. <laughs> I have give, even given him the wild animals to serve. I'm just gonna give him the animals as lanyap. You know, you have the people, you might as well have the animals. All the nations will serve him, his son and his grandson, until the time of his own land comes. And then many nations and great kings will enslave him. I love this. Everybody's gonna be a servant to Nebuchadnezzar, but he's my servant, but then one day he's gonna be their servant, says the Lord. See, Daniel knows that God is in control. Now, Jesus is gonna teach Pontius Pilate in the New Testament the same principle. Do you remember when he's, he's interrogating Jesus right before he's gonna send him the crucifixion and his wife has a dream and says, leave that man alone. He is a holy man. And so he has this dialogue with Jesus, John 19, verse 10. So Pilate said to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Watch Jesus. You have no authority over me at all, Jesus said, except if it hadn't been given to you from above. What does that mean for us today and the world we live in? Friends, I want you to get this point. God controls every leader through every generation of human history. God was in control over Nero in the first century. God was in control over Stalin in the 30s. He was in control over Churchill in the 40s, over Reagan in the 80s, over Trump in the last term, and Joe Biden, our president today. God is the commander in chief, amen? And Proverbs tells us this, Proverbs 21.1, a king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. God directs it wherever he wants to go. Here's the thing about our God. God is the one who sets up government, even bad ones, and God's the one who takes down governments, and God's still in control. So what does that mean for us? That means you can support a biblical candidate, you can get behind a biblical candidate, you can even vote for a biblical candidate, but you don't let your life fall apart when the candidate doesn't win. 
You don't put your hope and trust in a single candidate or a political party that the world is going to Hades in a handbasket when they lose. I wanna say this with love and I want you to hear it the, the right way. Our patriotism should never precede our passion for Jesus Christ. You get that? I'm, I'm grateful you're patriotic. I'm patriotic. I love our country. But it should never supersede our passion for Jesus Christ. Why? How many times did Jesus talk about Rome in the Bible? That's a real question. <laughs> That's a real question. You find me. How many times did Jesus talk about Rome? Did he ever tell his disciples, hey, listen, we just have to get the right Caesar in office, guys. If we could just get the right Caesar, things would be better. Did he ever say that? No. Did Paul ever rally the Christians to start praying? If we just had a Christian Caesar, if the guy was Christian, man, it would change the world. No, they never said that. Why? Because you have to realize, you're probably saying, well, why would they not do it? Rome was way worse in that century than America today. And I'm not down in America, but what I'm saying is the sexual perversion, the immorality, the death, the killing, the incest, the rape, every lewd sexually immoral act you can think of is in Rome. In fact, Rome of the first century makes America look like a Disney movie today. Well, not necessarily. The 90s Disney movies, okay? And that, right, okay, yeah. Let me clarify the movies today. <laughs> And yet, as bad as Rome was, Jesus never talked about Rome. He never said, let's get a law passed. He never said, let's have a policy change. Why? Because Jesus knew, and the Bible said, that the kings and the kingdoms would be on his back, that the government would be upon his shoulders. You gotta understand, Jesus had Rome and Caesar in his back pocket. And he knew that at any moment, he could do whatever he wanted. In fact, in fact the only time Jesus ever talks about Rome <laughs> is to pay taxes, right? He's like, when they come collect, just pay the tax. And the only time Paul talks about government is when he says, let's pray for our leaders. I mean, it's the only time you'll find that in the Bible. And so let us remember, and this is what's key. Jesus knew this truth. National reform, write this down. National reform always comes from individual reform. Say it again. National revival starts with individual revival. Why do you think he spent his ministry investing in a group of men and women who could change the world? And they did. Why? Because we're here today. So let us stop thinking that if we get the right person in the right seat in office or the right congressman in Congress or the right senator in the Senate or the right political party in the White House, things are going to change for good. I wanna say this again with a lot of love and I want you to hear it right. We as Christians are not here to save America. I love America, but that's not why we're here. We are here to make disciples and advance God's kingdom for the glory of God. That's why we're here. Now, here's the question. Should a Christian vote? Absolutely. Should a Christian run for office? Should a Christian stand for truth? Should we fight for justice? Should we take care of the welfare of our neighbor? Absolutely. However, we shouldn't spend all of our time waiting for the next candidate to be elected into an office as much as we should be waiting and watching for the return of Jesus Christ one day. Amen? Friends, let me just end with this. I know some of you are uncomfortable. But let me just end with this. What's gonna change this country? is not a political solution. What's gonna change this country is a prayer solution. If my people, let me remind you, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face and pray, then I will heal from, hear from heaven, heal their land, and I will answer their prayer. So the first thing Daniel knows is, Neb may be in charge, but it's God who's the commander in chief. Number two, which leads to this, and this is where it leads to, because the, that's the insight, here's the application, that's the theology, here's the practice. Never bow down to the culture of today. Never bow down to the culture of today. Look what happens. I mean, this is fascinating to me. 
that in Daniel chapter two, it ends with Nebuchadnezzar saying, your God is the God of gods. You're the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And then the very next thing he does, watch this. King Nebuchadnezzar makes a gold statue, 90 feet high and nine feet wide. <laughs> I mean, like, which shows us, here's another whole sermon insight here. Never put your faith in worldly, fickle, changing kingdoms. Because they can turn on a dime on you. Just like this one. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Verse four, a herald loudly proclaimed, people of every nation and language, you are commanded by the king. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, whatever that is, the lyre, the lyre, the harp, the drum, and every other kind of music, you are to fall face down and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. So what's gonna happen is the whole world's gonna bow down. Just a sidebar insight here. I've asked myself the question, Colin and Russell and I were talking this week. Where are the rest of the boys that were selected to be in the court? Like, is it only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Where, I mean, were guys like faking, tying shoes? I'll be right back, you know, I'm just gonna bow down. Is, is, are these the only three boys? You have to assume they are. But the question is, what is the rest of the world doing? Are they bowing down to the king? And so Nebuchadnezzar gets word and he gives another chance for these guys to bow down to the culture. And notice what happens. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. Yeah, I love this line. You know what they're saying? We, we don't need any time to think. We already know what we're gonna do. Remember last week? You have to decide before you decide what you're gonna do. They already know. Like, look, we don't need time. We already know what we're gonna do. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as the king to know. You gotta think of the boldness of these teenagers. They're talking to the king of the world. I want you to know we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. So here's the question. How can these young boys, teenagers, stand up to the king? And I believe it's because they live by conviction. So you gotta understand, they realize that they're not in Babylon just to populate the land and worship a false god. They know that they're in Babylon as an assignment from God who controls all things, and it's not by happenstance that they're there. They're there to worship God and obey him. And Nebuchadnezzar, they say to him, hey, listen, we don't need any time. Our mind is already made up. We know what we're gonna do. And if our God's real, he's gonna save us. And if our God wants us to die, he's still glorified. Young people, look at me just for a moment. This is called conviction. And it's a decision, it's a line in the, sand, in the sand you draw today so that when you're tempted and tested tomorrow, you know how you're gonna respond. When someone passes you a joint or someone gives you a, a jewel or, or, or a vape or someone uh, passes you a beer, man, everybody else is drinking or someone offers you drugs at a party, you don't have to think in the moment of what I'm gonna do, why? Because you already decided that in the past. You see, that's conviction. If you're married and you get a private Facebook message from an old girlfriend, or you get a text from a person of the opposite sex, or you, you get something sent to you that's gonna tempt you away from your spouse, you don't have to decide in the moment what you do. You cut off all ties, why? Because you live by conviction. That's what biblical conviction is. It's a set of standards that changes how you think, live, act, and, and obey God. Now, the question we're gonna end with, and here's the big question. Why in the world does Nebuchadnezzar lose his mind over these three boys bowing down to him? He's got a whole world of people that are bowing. Why the three boys? I mean, in fact, these are his choice selected Men, remember he just selected them in chapter one. And so these are the choice, intellectual, athletic, best looking, most aspiring. I mean, these are the guys. Why is Nebuchadnezzar so mad at these boys? One reason, you ready for this? 
He's mad because of their choice about the exclusivity of God. What do you mean, Robbie? See, Nebuchadnezzar realizes that these boys say there's one God and all the other gods are not God. You gotta understand what's happening. In Daniel chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar bows down to Daniel. And he says, hey, listen, I believe that your God is the God of gods and the, and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I will add your God to the laundry list of false gods I already worship. So as long as I could say your God is one of the many gods, we're fine. But the moment they say, no, our God is God and every other God is not, that's when he loses his mind and throws them in the fire. Look at me. If you go in the world today, and you confess Jesus as Lord of your life, people may amen that. Man, that's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. But the moment you tell a lost culture that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no other way to the Father except through him, you're going to get persecuted. Wouldn't you agree? The moment you say Jesus saves sinners, People, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. That is so good. They'll, they'll even support that. But the moment you say there is only name, one name under heaven by which men and women can be saved, and that one name is Jesus Christ, you're going to be chastised. I mean, that's what the world does today. Let's take, for example, the series I'm coming uh, up to in, in, in la on Labor Day. The world would say, listen, I'm fine with you wanting to be married to to your spouse forever of an opposite sex. I'm fine with you being married to someone of the opposite sex. I'm fine with you waiting before marriage to have sex. You can do whatever you want, but don't you dare tell me that sex before marriage is a sin. Don't you dare tell me that living with my girlfriend or boyfriend and shacking up before marriage is wrong. And don't you dare tell me that I can't have a relationship with someone of the same sex. In fact, if you don't march in my gay pride parade, if you don't support my lifestyle, if you don't bow down to my sexual preference, I will throw you in the burning fire. In fact, I'll go more than that. I will hack your online accounts. I will mess up your Facebook. I will threaten your family. I will boycott your business. And I will move sporting events from one city to another to prove a point. And the list goes on and on and on. Listen to what the world says. The world says, you can have a Christian conviction. Just keep it in the closet. You can have convictions all you want. Just don't tell me about them because they're offensive. Let me remind us today that the gospel is offensive. Listen, being a Christian is offensive. That's what you signed up for. In fact, I'll prove it to you. The guy we follow, by the way, offended everybody when he was here, by the way. You know, Jesus, he offended everybody, right? I love what Leonard Ravenhill said about Jesus. He said, when he was born, there was no room for him in the inn. He had no place to stay. There was no room for him in his family. His own family turned upon him. There was no room for him in the temple. The temple turned upon him. And when he died, there was no room to even crucify or even bury him in the city. They buried him outside of the city. Here's what he said. Why in God's name do we expect to be accepted everywhere? Here it is. If the world couldn't get along with the holiest man who ever lived, how in the world do we expect them to get along with us? Have we compromised? Do we have no spiritual stature? Do we have no biblical backbone? Have we bowed down to the gods of Baal and Babylon? Friends, I don't know about you, but I would rather be right with God and wrong with men than to be right with men and wrong with God. And I'm here to tell you as your pastor, we may see a time when preaching what I'm about to preach will either cause me to lose my job or lose my freedom. And I told our church a long time ago, God's not called me to build a church. He's called me to preach the truth. And if something happens to me, you can come visit me in jail because I'll have a jail ministry. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, praise God. Amen. So that's my promise, my promise to you.
Uh, the line, um, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything, was actually created by Alexander Hamilton. Just a cool history lesson here. Uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, started this line. He actually created this line. In a world where everyone was saying, don't stand for anything, just be everything to everyone. But he knew you had to stand for something. And uh, a psychologist and a doctor, Gordon Eady, actually kind of diagnosed this phrase because it was used all throughout history, particularly in World War II, where the soldiers were constantly taught this. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for everything. And what he found is this. He said, so, the reason we tell the soldiers this, this is interesting, is that so many of the boys have only a hazy idea of what they're battling. And so they don't know, we have to teach them not only what we're battling against, but we have to teach them what we're battling for. And if we don't teach them what we're battling for, we lose sight and we get kind of delusion. And he said, it's kind of a dangerous state to be in. Why? Because if you don't stand for something, you will fall for everything. And here's what he said. He said, we have to teach the soldiers that they're fighting two battles. They're fighting the battle of arms, the war of arms, which is the physical battle, but they're also fighting the battle of ideas. And I think what he's saying is, and I think we could, we could apply this to our Christian life. When we lose sight of why we are fighting and what we're fighting for and the significance of why it matters, we lose, right? You gotta realize what we're doing here. We don't just meet here to sing a bunch of cool worship songs and hear a message and go home. We are fighting for what's at stake, which is the eternal resting place of souls. We are fighting against the status quo of wasting a life when you only get one shot here. We are fighting against people going to a place called hell, which is separated from God. The Bible says, which is unbearable fire, gnashing of teeth and separation in an eternal resting place. That's what we're fighting for. And if we don't know what we're fighting for, we will fall in the moment. See, listen, the reason you waffle so easily in the culture is because you haven't developed a conviction by drawing a biblical line in the sand and saying, come Hades or high water, we're standing on God in his word. And I feel like as we come to this closing moment, I feel like some of you need to reaffirm, and you know who you are, reaffirm your commitment to God. Because some of you have let politics, nationalism, and athleticism, and everything else get in the way of your commitment to God. Whether you're a father or a mother or a single adult or a student or a senior citizen, I don't know, or senior, I don't know where you are, but I'm gonna pray over us in a moment and I'm gonna ask you just for a moment, just bow your head with me. I'm gonna ask you. If you need to reaffirm your commitment to Christ, and I'm speaking predominantly to believers here, and I don't know who you are, but you do. You don't have to say anything. I'm not gonna call you forward. I simply want you to acknowledge publicly before a holy God that you are serious. And the way we're gonna do that is I'm gonna ask you to simply just stand right where you are, and then you're standing without, without saying anything. You're saying, I'm reaffirming my commitment to God. If you're a young person, if you're a student in here and you have wavered back and forth, your others are standing. So you just, just right now, just stand to your feet and I'm gonna pray a, a special prayer. I'm gonna pray a prayer specifically over you to be the father God's called you to be, to be the student God's called you to be. So if you need to stand, thank you. People standing all over, you just stand. You don't have to say a word, don't have to look around. In fact, when you stand, just stay in a posture of prayer. No one looking around. Just right now, if you need to stand, and you know who you are. Pastor, pray over me. Pray for my family, pray for me. I'm gonna reaffirm my commitment. I'm a student, I've played games far too long. I've lived a hypocritical life for far too long. I've been a Pharisee for way too long. People think I'm a good Christian man, I'm living a lie right now. People think I'm a godly Christian woman, I'm not living that way. And God, you know and I know and today I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm not going back. I'm not retreating. I'm not returning. I'm moving forward today. So if that's you, right now, just stand for a moment. People already standing all over. Father, we pray right now for those who are
taking a stand, a biblical stand, God, to not bow, very, very similar to the stand that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, to not bow down to the false god of Baal and Babylon, God, and not to bend the knee to the culture of Nebuchadnezzar. And God, I feel like we're in a similar culture today, and so I pray for strength for these parents, for these individuals, for these students, for these these marriages, God, to be able to stand biblically on conviction. They know what's right. Now it's time for us to live what we know. It's time for us to not only know what we believe, but why we believe it. And so help us today, God, in a world that is against everything you stand for. Give us the courage to do that. And I pray for a filling, a controlling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. We ask it today in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said,